Hi, I'm Governor Rod Blagojevich, and you're watching Taped with Rabbi Doug on Mensch. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug. We're gonna see Rabbi Doug, We're gonna see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I want to watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're going to watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, everybody talk about Doug. Shalom and welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. Glad you could be with us today. My guest today is National Hockey League goalie Dove Grummet Morris. Dove, welcome to the show. Rabbi, thank you for having me. Glad to have you here. I, I want to tell you all that I've known Dove since he was young, and uh, I'm good friends with his family. It is a great pleasure to have you on the show, and I want to congratulate you on your newest NHL contract, and uh, I want to tell a little bit about you. You are now a member of the Nashville National Hockey League team, and uh, you are going to be now uh, part of the Predators uh, you know, on their roster, and uh, we'll see what happens with your career because you have a great career in the past. Um, tell me, first of all, you know, you're from a hockey family. Every one of your siblings uh, has played hockey, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, but what attracted you to really want to become professional? Uh, well, when I was younger, I, I really enjoyed playing hockey. Every time I got on the ice, it was a way for me to get away from everything else, no matter what I was doing, whether I had a test the next day, whether uh, my older sister was picking on me. Whenever I was on that ice, there was nothing else that was going on except for that game, and I really enjoyed it. And anytime you have something like that, you feel special and you feel a connection, uh, you, you want to pursue that and you want to keep that in your life. Sometimes for people it's music, whether they play an instrument, whether they sing, whether it's uh, being part of a community, helping out, uh, volunteering at an organization. Whatever it is, you, you want to keep that in your life, and that's something that I was fortunate enough to, to have. My parents encouraged it. Um, they uh, fostered my development. And when I was able to go to college and play, I think, was when I really started to believe that I could continue on with it after my college years. Now, we just, uh, and Mazel Tov about this, we just celebrated recently your brother Zev's bar mitzvah, and I had yep. the honor of officiating. And you said at the bar mitzvah party to my four-year-old daughter, you said to her, when I started out going on the ice, because she told you she liked ice skating, yeah, yeah. you said, I was holding on and falling down and crawling around the skating rink, holding on to the side. How long, you know, how old were you when you started going on ice skates and learning to ice skate? <laughs> because she's four years old, and she's been on once, and she wants to go back all the time. She loves it. How did you get a love for ice skating? Because you have to do that first before you play hockey, obviously. Oh, yeah. You've got to learn to skate before you can play. I mean, that's the, uh, the, the base for the entire sport. But for myself, at least, I grew up when I was very young. I can still remember when I was probably two and a half, almost three years old, going to my father's just men's league rec, rec league games, and I'd sit in the stands, and, of course, I'd have my blanket for my bed wrapped around me because it was very cold in the rink. And I saw the players, and I just thought it looked very cool, and I wanted to skate. So my father started taking me to the open skates, which is just, you know, you go to your local rink, the Skadium or the Evanston uh, ice hockey rink, and you pay $2, and you can learn to skate just around on your own. And uh, I actually have a picture of, of, uh, of myself when I was probably about three and a half, maybe four years old, with um, my helmet, gloves, and the elbow pads uh, on, and the shin pads in shoes. And I was at my preschool waiting for my parents, for my father to pick me up and take me to the, to the ice skating lessons because I, I wanted to bring all my equipment. I wanted to be ready. I didn't want to lose any time, any possible time on that ice. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Well, I, I, I want to thank your uh, press secretary <laughs> and one of my favorite attorneys, uh, Aviva Grummet Morris, yeah. um, Aviva, for, for telling me a little bit of your history. And uh, I'd like to share that with our viewers because you've had an incredible history of, of, in hockey, and I want to tell about it now. Dove Grummet Morris began playing hockey at age three and a half. He decided early on that he wanted to be a goaltender and took up the position at his first team. Uh, he played until the age of nine in the Skokie Youth Organization, then moved on to play for teams in Lake Forest and Park Ridge. By age 13, he was playing for AAA organizations like the Chicago Young Americans and Team Illinois, traveling extensively throughout the Midwest and Canada and playing against the very best hockey players at his, in his age bracket. And I know your parents traveled with you so much. Oh, it's yeah. just amazing how they're able to do that. Um, after graduating high school, Dove moved to Danville, Illinois, to play junior A hockey for the Danville Wings of the North American Hockey League. 
While with the Wings, he was recruited to play at several top universities, including Miami of Ohio, University of Michigan, and Princeton. Ultimately, he chose to finish his amateur career with Harvard University, where he was the starting goalie for four years. As a member of the Crimson Hockey Club, Dove backstopped the team to two Eastern Collegiate Athletic Crim uh, Conference Championships and four appearances in the NCAA playoffs. He also broke and now holds 13 individual school records, including but not limited to shutouts in a season, in a career, goals against average for a season, games played in a season, and career in the highest save percentage for an individual season. Dove was recognized for his many achievements on the ice as a second-team All-American winner of the Walter Brown Memorial Trophy, given annually to the top American-born college hockey player in New England and a top 10 finalist for the prestigious Hobie Baker Awards, college hockey's equivalent to the Heisman Trophy. Additionally, Dove was recognized for his work off the ice as well, becoming an academic All-American in 2005. In 2002, after his freshman year, Dove was drafted in the fifth round National Hockey League draft by the Philadelphia Flyers. Following his graduation from Harvard, he signed his first professional contract with the San Antonio Rampage and played the season with their minor league team, the Laredo Bucks, winning the league championship in his first year of professional hockey. This past year, he divided his time between the East Coast Hockey League and the American League, playing with the Cincinnati Cyclones and the Portland Pirates and the Manitoba Moose. Last week, from the time we're taping, Dove signed a contract with the National Predators of the National Hockey League. Wow. It's just great. It's just Thank great. You. And just covering the years, from 2001 to 2005, you were the goalie for Harvard. Yep. Um, 2005 and six, you were with the San Antonio Rampage and the Rado Bucks. 2006 and, and 2007, you were with the Cincinnati Cyclones, the Portland Pirates, the Hamilton Bulldogs, and the Manitoba Moose. And now, of course, the National the National Predators. And you're going to be working out in the uh, Milwaukee Admirals, which is their minor league team. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's, and that's in in Milwaukee. Yeah, that's in Milwaukee, and it. Uh, it basically you start the season on their roster in September in Nashville, and then uh, according to how you play and the depth, injuries, et cetera, you might stay or you might go down to the minor leagues. That way you don't sit on the bench for too long and not play. That, that happens a lot for younger guys. It's more important for them to go down and play. Wow, wow, wow. Um, you graduated from Harvard with a double major in government and Near Eastern languages and civilizations. Um, and, and just amazingly, in your hockey family. Your older sister, Aviva, was an all-ECAC defender in the Princeton women's hockey team, graduating in 2003, and now she's an attorney. And uh, also your other four siblings, uh, Ariel, Amit, Yardena, and Zev are all hockey players too. Yeah, that's it's, right. It's just amazing. It really is. I, it's hard to believe. And you yourself are a graduate of Solomon Schechter Day School. <laughs> You have a, an extensive, uh, you know, traditional family, Jewish background, and, and I know you're very tradi traditionally observant yourself. Do you find that going into professional hockey, I know that it's sort of compromised a little bit of, of, of the synagogue and religious practices being a professional hockey player, but do you think it's compromised any of your religious um, personal you know, feeling saying, yeah, I really shouldn't be doing this, or, 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 or you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm not comfortable with this. Has that, has that ever come into play, or do you think that the, the enthusiasm and the love for what you're doing kind of all melds in with, what, with, with how you want to be? Well, you know, it's, that's a very good question, and I get that asked a lot. Um, and one of the things is that, actually, I think that playing professional athletics, being one of the only Jews that are either on a team or maybe one of two, or definitely maybe one of, one of only a few in the league, helps to um, solidify my position as a Jew in the sense that I really have to turn to myself and figure out what is important to me and, and retain the values and the traditions that I've practiced my entire life. And it, it becomes even more important and more apparent. And um, I, I tend to appreciate more the things that I had when I was younger, having Shabbos with my family every night um, because the schedule was uh, never conflicting. I mean, Shabbos was Friday, Friday nights. nights. Were Friday nights. And uh, it seems that in today's, not just society, but just today in general, we have so many things going on that uh, we tend to overlook things like that. Having Shabbos dinner, having time to just spend with the family where everyone sits down at 
at the dinner table together, especially in a large family like mine with eight people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, someone's going here, someone's going there, soccer practice, softball, baseball. But, uh, you know, it's something that I really appreciate. And uh, interestingly, um, because of what it is that I do and the transient nature of our business, I get to see a lot of the country. But more importantly, I get to see a lot of do different Jewish communities. Um, just in the last two years, I've had um, high holidays, Passover dinners in Omaha, Nebraska, Hamilton, Ontario, Laredo, Texas, San Antonio, Boston, Chicago, and you know the list goes on and on. And so you really get a feel for the different communities, the different traditions, and you also understand that you, as being someone who's Jewish, you are part of a greater community no matter where you go, and a home is always open to you. And I've never been in a situation once where I've been in need of a, of a family to go to have Shabbos dinner with or high holidays or find a synagogue, and I've always been accommodated. That always. is so cool. And it's so cool for you to say that for other people to hear it. There is a way when there's a will. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Very nice. Um, I want to talk about the Hobie Baker Award because I believe that is like the most prestigious award for a college hockey player. Is that right? Yeah, that's uh, the equivalent of what uh, the Heisman Trophy is for football. Uh, and can you can you um, show me here? In Bo you have from uh, uh, an article from the Boston newspaper, right? Uh, Boston yeah. Globe. Boston Globe. Yeah. Boston Globe. When you received this award, is that it? Uh, tell me about yeah. tell me about what you're going to show us in a minute. Oh uh, well, I think that this is a piece that was done uh, right before the 2005 Beanpot Tournament, which was in the middle or towards the end of my senior year when I was nominated for all the uh, senior or the end of the year awards, and it was a piece that was done. Um, I researched very extensively. The guy did an excellent job, and he didn't necessarily know uh, a lot about hockey, but he he did he did a lot of research into where I came from, uh, the different people that I interacted with growing up, and the people who had influences on my life, both in hockey and outside of it. And uh, it was uh, it was a, a piece that was very well done, and I know my parents are very proud. Okay, let, let's take a look sure. at that. This is a uh, uh, permaplex, so it's uh, uh, permanently uh, on here and. Uh, Let's hold this up together so that uh, Alan and the camera there can uh, get a little bit uh, closer view of it. And we'll try and get some glare off of it. And uh, it says the Boston Globe, a quick study at Harvard, and there he is, Dove Grummet Morris, not only a uh, picture of his face, but in the goal there, number 30, number 30. And uh, just amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful article. And I remember when it came out that your parents emailed it to me and uh, how amazing it was. And there he is. You see him up close there. Uh, that's our man, Dove Grumman. <laughs> yes, there he is. Uh, I, I'm sure, are, are you, I know, you know, I used to teach a Sabin at one time too. Um, you must, it's such a close-knit Jewish community, especially because, you know, you're in school from elementary school uh, through junior high school, middle school, uh, with the same people. Are you still in touch with a lot of those same friends that you were, that you grew up with? I am, I am. I've just recently, having uh, returned uh, to the Chicagoland area in the past uh, couple of weeks, I've actually been able to get back together with a bunch of my buddies, and we, we go out, we try to go out and have uh, maybe dinner on Tuesday night, and uh, we're actually planning a, a large reunion for a whole bunch of the classes uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. So sure. we, we do our best to stay in touch. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So tell me... Um, now, what is, what is the difference with the contract that you've just signed with Nashville compared to the contract you were on in the past? Uh, where did that one um, promise or lead you to mm -hmm. compared to where this one is leading you to? Well, uh, there's two different aspects to any kind of contract in terms of uh, professional hockey. One is opportunity and one is financial. So there's the financial aspect, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, the better the contract, the more money you get guaranteed. And that's always helpful in order to allow you to do the things that you want to do both in hockey and outside of hockey, such as travel, uh, spend time with your family, bring people in during the season to see you. And because it can be lonely living on your own for nine months at a time and not really having, say, an off weekend to go to travel. Um, and the other part of it is the opportunity to move up. And that's kind of where your question leads in, in the sense that in the previous contracts, they've been strictly minor league, uh, specifically American League contracts. And um, those allow for you to play in the American League, which is the AAA, and the East Coast League, which is AA. And I played in both those leagues previously. And uh, they're developmental leagues. They're for younger guys, for people right out of college. They're trying to work their way up. They need game experience, very similar to baseball in the sense that it takes a while. You need many games played in order to gain that experience. 
Um, and then there's an NHL contract, which is the new contract that I just signed, and that is saying that you are affiliated, you're on the roster with an NHL team, and they are specifically interested in developing you as a player at the AAA level, the American League, which is the league that the Wolves play in. Mm -hmm. And they want to move you up into the National Hockey League at some point, whether it be in weeks, days, weeks, months, or years, in order to have you a part of the, the major league club, if you will. Okay, now let, let me just take a, a, a scenario. You're playing, you had a, let's say, a AAA contract in the past, mm -hmm. and you're playing on a AAA American Hockey League team, and uh, the team that owns that American Hockey League team is a National Hockey League team, I presume. Correct. And their goalies are just either goofing up or get <laughs> injured or whatever yep. the case might be. Now, even though you're on the American League contract, they could pull you right up to the NHL then, couldn't they, if they wanted to? Uh, if you are not under an NHL contract, no. It very, very, mm. very rarely happens. It's possible, but in the middle of a season, they don't do that because, generally speaking... So it's a little bit different than baseball in the minor leagues. Right, right. Generally speaking, you don't go up unless you're on that NHL contract. Now, it does happen from time to time, but it very rarely happens. That's why it's very important to become established within an organization and get that contract because there is a packing order. And like you said, injuries do happen. Um, they, it's just part of the game. It's someone was asking me earlier outside, you know, how, how often do goalies get hurt? And of course it has everything to do with the circumstance, but how many times does someone go through the year at work, whether it's in an office or whether it's at a, a work that requires a lot of physical activity where they don't get sick or they don't miss a day because they may have gotten hurt or they've been in a car accident. Something happens. Things happen to everyone. I know, I remember when Sammy Sosa was put on the disabled list because he sneezed hard and he hurt his back. I mean, this stuff happens. Yeah. So, uh, so, so it's all part of it. And then that important um, aspect of your career as a younger guy is being able to move up. And that is allowed by the specific type of contract that you have. Now, Thank God you've got all your teeth. <laughs> and, and, and it's not a joke because we see all the time hockey players who lose their teeth. What is the key to protecting your teeth? Because that seems to be uh, the most famous thing. You see hockey players come up for, for yeah. press conferences with missing teeth and stuff. Absolutely. And what is the key for hockey players, number one, to not uh, get broken teeth? And, and number two, how do you feel you protect your teeth uh, to the best of your ability as, as a goalie? Well, uh, most, most players, generally speaking, don't start to lose teeth until they turn pro or until they decide to, be, um, to play men's league without a mask. And they, the key is the cage. When you have your cage, you protect it very, very can well. We see, can we see uh, your, your helmet? Here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Can, can well, this is, this is my mask. This is slightly different than what a forward would wear in that uh, it covers both the entire head and the, uh, and the cage in the front to cover the eyes and the mouth. And that's one of the reasons for me personally why I don't have any teeth missing because I do have this barrier between the puck and myself. Are there other goalies that don't wear something that, this, that is this protective? Uh, well, they used to. They used to not wear a mask at all, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, then they've changed the rules, and now the, the technology is so fantastic that every goalie wears a mask that's very similar to that. In fact, over 90% of the goalies in the NHL actually wear this specific mask, which is, which is an iTech mask. Mm -hmm. It's the name of the company. Um, and this whole piece here that you can see is actually made out of Kevlar. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's Kevlar woven inside this cage as well. And uh, this plastic piece is down here. It's a throat guard, and that's very, very thick. It's, it's kind of like uh, maybe a quarter of the thickness that you would have on the on the, like a space shuttle glass. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very thick because the puck comes at, you know, 90 miles an hour and anything that hits you at 90 miles an hour could hurt. And you're wearing the mouth guard in your mouth also at the same time. And additionally, what players, uh, by wearing a mouth guard, which every team provides, that actually helps to prevent um, not so much uh, an issue with your teeth, although for the forwards it is, but it's more for concussions because it allows you to protect your mouth from biting down and from rattling more. Oh. And actually there's a very famous... Uh, famous NHL player named Pat LaFontaine who used to play for the Buffalo Sabres among other teams and he ended his career short because of the concussions and one of the things he said he wished he had worn a mouth guard. Now at that time they didn't really develop the mouth guard technology as a common use in the NHL but that's one of the things that uh, that attributes to concussions or lack thereof. Wow, wow, <laughs> you're really protected. Yeah, um, very does, much so. Does, is your, is your vision, your path of vision, your sight and stuff is pretty clear with, with the mask? It is. You might not think when so. you were younger, you didn't wear something this extensive, obviously. Right. So that's why I asked the question. Do you feel like when you were younger, you had a better uh, sight, uh, you know, than you do now? <laughs> well, it's funny. It's like when you're younger, uh, nothing bothers you, right? When you're younger, you can fall down and scrape your knees and you just keep going. 
Uh, but uh, with these masks, they're very, very well engineered. They spent a lot of time designing them. And personally, I don't feel as if my vision is taken away at all. And one of the things is that uh, you, it's like anything, you, you adapt to what it is that you're using and you really become less aware of the bars and you actually just see through the bars that are there. And, and it really is, isn't an issue at all. Okay, I have a big question for you as a okay. goalie. You know, we who are hockey fans and have been hockey fans for years always look forward to that goalie seeing an open spot and saying, I'm leaving the net and I'm going to take that puck and I'm going to get it across the ice. Have you ever gone down very far or do your coaches discourage that and you don't do it because you're going to get yelled at? <laughs> well, it's definitely when I was in college, uh, I had a, a restriction. The coach said, all you can do is go behind the net and you can come back in front of the net and that's it. You can't go into the corners. No wandering. Uh, and uh, that's a little bit of an older school mentality, but in his defense, I wasn't very good at playing the puck. Um, and one of the things, though, is it's, it's uh, you know, I had a goalie coach who's a very smart guy. He's a business major, and he used to always say that it's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis. What's it going to cost for you to go out there and play it, and what's the benefit from doing it? So one of the things that you do is you do try and go out there if it's going to help your players, help the situation, but uh, if ever in doubt, you always play it safe. And so you just say, look, I get paid to stay inside that net and protect the puck, not to play the puck. Very nice. Um, you are obviously going to have a great career ahead of you, and, and it's very exciting to see you move up in the ranks, watch you go through college and so on and so forth. Is there someone, just one person, and you don't even have to name them if you do, is there someone who you think along the way who coached you, whoever that person was, that, that was like the biggest influence on you? I want to give them credit right now if there was one. There may have been many, and you may say, no, there wasn't one. But is there one person that really taught you the most and, and led you on the path uh, the farthest? Well, there's, there's definitely several. I mean, any, any professional athlete who gets anywhere in their career, it's never alone, despite what they might think or despite what they might say. No one has ever made it 100% based on everything that they've done where they've never had any luck or anyone help them along the way. Um, and for me personally, I've had several people who have helped me along the way. And, uh, you know, the list actually is very long. And, uh, it, it, it sometimes they help in different ways. So, for instance, mom and dad. Number mom one. and dad would have to be number one because they're the ones who introduced me to the sport who fostered my traveled development, with you. traveled, spent the money, the time and the effort, the encouragement were there on the bad games, which a lot of people forget that when you're little, that's the most important thing, not to be there when you play well, to be there when you're not playing well. And that happens. Um, sometimes you have a bad game, sometimes you have a bad week, a bad year, and mom and dad were always there to help me out. And my father taught me the fundamentals of the game when I was very young. I had a coach when uh, growing up here in the Chicagoland area, area named Tom Adratus, and he was very instrumental in teaching me the, the mental part of the game in the sense of how you should act, how you should portray yourself uh, to your teammates, but also how you need to react to different situations and consistent mental training. I had my goalie coach in college who uh, really helped to revamp my game and take it to another level where I could become a successful goaltender at, at the collegiate level. And, he really helped me to understand the game from a different mental perspective, a game of billiards where you're setting yourself up for another play uh, as opposed to just pure reaction, which mm -hmm. a lot of people think the game is, and it really is, but it's more than that, and that's one of the things that you have to learn. It's opening these individuals, and there are more on that list, but these individuals that I've named, what they do is they open up a different part of that world, and they show you the direction that you should be going, and then it's up to you to continue on in the direction that you choose. That's very cool. Um, you now are about to go to the Bradley Center to work out uh, with the team in, in Milwaukee. Is hockey like, uh, you know, you think of baseball, somebody who's a baseball player and a football player where they don't get these breaks during their season, they, and, and I know hockey's like that too, and then all of a sudden they get like the three-month or the four-month vacation time. <laughs> it, it doesn't seem to be that way to me in hockey. It seems like you're always working out. There is no, there is no like, real off-season. There's off-season from playing games that are, you know, professional games, mm -hmm. but it seems like you're always working out in hockey. Is, is that really the case? Do you only get, like, a few weeks here and a few weeks there or a couple weeks here? a couple weeks there, like someone in business who says <laughs> I could take a two-week vacation and a two-week vacation here. Uh, is it like that in hockey, or do you, do you have a long off time like uh, baseball and football do before they have to report to camp? <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you one thing. I, I picked the wrong sport. I should have done baseball. They have a better league, a better union, and they have uh, more time off. But, uh, you know, 
in terms of hockey, it really is, it's, it's all year. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the reason why is this. Um, the money that's involved, teams expect you to put in more than just the nine to five. They expect you more the, to, to be there more than just September till May, which is what it used to be. Back in the 50s and 60s, hockey players would go home to their hometowns. They would sell insurance. They would work at the car dealership. They would work on their farm. And they would supplement their income doing that. Now that's not the way it is. It is all year round. They expect you to be there for summer training. They expect you to play in summer leagues. You're supposed to lift weights every day, five days a week in the summers. You can take two weeks at the end of your season in May. At the beginning of June is when you're supposed to start working out. Maybe a week here or a week there in the summer where you take a few days, a long weekend. But really the onus is on you as an individual, as a professional, to keep it going all year round. And it's tough. No one expects you to necessarily play at that elite level, that playoff level in the off season. But uh, there, are, there are a lot of requirements where you have to take into consideration your workouts before you set any plans. Wow. Well, I, I got to tell you, it's great to see you home with your family for a few days. Yeah. And I just want to thank you for you know, coming down to be on the show. You are my first National Hockey League guest. <laughs> now, there are three... Uh, Jewish hockey players in the National Hockey League besides you. There's two others, right? Well, there's two. There's two others that I'm aware of. What are their names? Uh, Matthew Snyder. And he's on? And he's on the Detroit Red Wings. Uh And Jeff Halpern, who's on the uh, Dallas uh, Stars, who actually went to Princeton with my older sister. But you're the only Jewish goalie. Ah, yeah, that that we know of. Well, I want to thank you so much. Dove Grummet Morris. thank you. um, Wish you much success with the uh, Nashville Predators and in the National Hockey League, and uh, we here in Chicago love you, and maybe someday you'll be traded to the Blackhawks, and we'll watch you, <laughs> we'll watch you on cable TV on the, on the away games and, and, the, and the, on, on TV for the away games and ne- cable TV for the home games, and, and uh, you'll be may- maybe right here on the same channel as me on <laughs> Taped with Rabbi Doug. But listen, Dove, wish you all the best, much success in your career, and uh, only great things in the future. Thank you very much. All right. And I want to thank all of you, our viewers, for being with us and and joining Dove and joining me today. Remember, uh, our website, www.tvrabbi.com. If you want to drop Dove an email, I'm sure if I forward it to him, he'll be happy to get back to you. That's taped at tvrabbi.com or info at tvrabbi.com. And I'll be happy to forward it on to Dove. I want to remember to tune in every single week at this very same time because we have a lot more coming Uh, in the future. Great guests, great shows. So see you next time right here on Take with Rabbi Doug. Thanks. Bye-bye. Shalom. I'm a